The following program is sponsored by CBN. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. A lot of news going on for you today. The Democratic darling Beto O'Rourke raised an amazing $6.1 million in one day. And uh, is that going to have an impact on Joe Biden? Well, we'll talk about that with David Brody. And snow melt from the so-called bomb cyclone has been flooding the Midwest. Nebraska is under uh, a, a state of emergency. The river is crested at, I think, un, uh, unimaginable heights. And even a, a, a United States uh, Air Force uh, uh, base is underwater. It's just amazing what's happening. But we'll be talking uh, in another few days about what's happening in California, because when that snow melt from the Sierras comes down, the flooding is going to be ghastly. And we also know that CBN News is going to the Middle East with uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Well. Beto O'Rourke looks like a money machine, but he's uh, off to a bumpy start. He got single mothers mad at him when he made a joke about parenting. Well, CBN political correspondent David Brody is going to join us to talk about the 2020 campaign and more. Terry? Well, while Beto is making headlines and more Democratic candidates are joining the 2020 race, there's one name that's dominating the conversation. As Amber Strong reports, Democrats want Joe Biden to get in the fray. The ever-widening field of 2020 candidates grew again this weekend, but it was a slip of the tongue from former Vice President Joe Biden that's called everyone's attention. I have the most progressive record of anybody running for the United States, anybody who would run. Friend and Senator Chris no, Coons adding to the speculation. Well, I'm very optimistic <laughs> that Joe Biden will soon formally announce his campaign for the presidency. A long political career could mean more than a few stumbling blocks for Biden. He's going to have to answer questions on everything from his role in the Anita Hill testimony to his voting record. Polls show, however, he's still the top pick for Democratic voters. On the whole, the Democratic Party primary electorate will be very satisfied uh, with Joe Biden's record. New candidate Beto O'Rourke spent the weekend backtracking from verbal gaffes, coming under fire for being insensitive to single parents after joking that his wife does most of the parenting in their home. Meanwhile, Democrats are using President Trump's response to a question on white nationalism to raise questions about his role in violent attacks. The president got the question after the terrorist attack on two mosques in New Zealand Friday. You see today white nationalism as a rising threat around the world. I don't really. I think it's a uh, small group of people that have very, very serious problems. Presidential contender Kirsten Gillibrand, who announced her candidacy Sunday, tweeted, Time and time again, this president has embraced and emboldened white supremacists. And instead of condemning racist terrorists, he covers for them. Acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney says trying to make this about the president is simply politics. To simply ask the question every time something like this happens overseas, or even domestically to say, oh my goodness, it must somehow be the president's fault, speaks to a, a politicization of everything. Let's take what happened in New Zealand yesterday for what it is, a terrible, evil, tragic act. Such strong political jabs so early on in the election suggest the closer we get to the campaign, the more heated things will become from both sides. Amber Strong, CBN News in Washington. Well, joining us now is CBN Chief Political Analyst David Brody. And David, it looks like the children have taken over the Democratic Party, and some of the proposals they make is absolutely absurd. But uh, do you think they're going to go for Biden? It looks like that slip of the tongue. He really is out running, isn't he? Yeah, Joe Biden's going to run. Uh, he's been called Uncle Joe. Uh, there have been a few other... Uh, uh, terms that have been used for him as well. Look, uh, Biden's going to get in, Pat, and here's the thing with Biden. He is authentic. That's his strength. And here's his weakness. He's authentic. That's part of the problem. He's been a gaffe machine throughout the years when he's run for president. The question is, can you be authentic but not too authentic to the point where you kind of mess yourself up? And that's been Joe Biden's Achilles heel all along. Uh, we'll see how he does. I have to tell you, we have a lot to talk about with Joe Biden because he does appeal to that blue-collar 
uh, Democrat that Donald Trump got in 2016. I think that's going to be real important going forward. Well, uh, David, you know, they got him for uh, plagiarizing Neil Kinnock in the last, uh, the first time he was out of the box. And uh, he has become now like an elder statesman. He's a real nice guy. And he does appeal to the uh, middle class. Did you think he could beat Trump? Yes, I think he's the one candidate that can beat Donald Trump. Uh, I think a lot of the other candidates are going to have their challenges. Uh, but Joe Biden, and here's why he can beat Donald Trump. First of all, as we talked about, he can win back some of those voters that Donald Trump won in 2016. That's really important. Also, look, Donald Trump loves to define everybody, right? Lion Ted, Little Marco, uh, what is it, Crying Chuck. Uh, now uh, Bernie Sanders is the nutty professor. But here's the thing with Biden. You really can't define Biden. He's been around for too long. It's just not going to work. And Biden will, let's be honest, if I can say this, Pat, he'll get in the gutter with Trump if he has to. A lot of those other candidates are going to maybe try to take the high road and not go there. Biden doesn't care. He'll slug it out. And I think the only way to beat Trump is you got you to kind of slug it out with him. Biden's that guy. What about Beto? Is that just a flash in the pan? Does he have enough substance that can go the route? That's the key question, Pat. He's untested. Uh, he has a lot of appeal. He raises money. He is also, when I say authentic, maybe too authentic to the point where, you know, he's already committed a few gaffes along the way. And, of course, Donald Trump trying to already um, pigeonhole him and kind of uh, define him by talking about his hands, how he uses his hands so much, and that has caught on. So uh, part of the problem with Beto O'Rourke and a lot of these other candidates, too, is that because uh, they haven't been through the rigors, Donald Trump has an open slate to really uh, kind of define who they are. Of course, Beto O'Rourke's going to try to define who he is. Uh, yeah, I think he's got a shot. He's kind of Obama-like, and what I mean by that is that uh, he's able to just kind of wear it on his sleeve, and he's very good at relating to folks and he raises money and he does have the it factor. And how do you explain the it factor? Well, that's the thing, Pat, you just don't explain it. You either have it or you don't. And he does have it, uh, but he's untested. I would say this, Pat, let's remember that when it comes to policy, he's going to have to bone up pretty quickly because he hasn't really come to some final conclusions, whether it be Medicare for all or a lot of the socialism programs that many of these Democrats support. You know, there was an overwhelming vote in the House, I mean, overwhelming, to release the Mueller report. Um, do you have any insight about when that's going to happen and what it might contain? Well, I feel like every week we will talk about it and we'll say, you know, we really think it's coming this week, Pat. Haven't we been saying that for about three or four months? Um, there are some signs. Here we go again. There are some signs that the Mueller report seems to be definitely winding down, could be imminent, could be in the next week or two. Why? There's a guy on the team, on the Mueller team, Andrew Weissman, who is no longer on the team. He's moving on to another project. And so the sense is, is that if the team, if the gang, if the is breaking up, then that is a suggestion that indeed there is a winding down process here. So we'll see. Remember that House resolution you talked about is just that. It doesn't have the force of law, but it is a resolution just in the House. The Senate never took it up and they won't take it up. And so uh, I think a lot of this is going to be up to Bill Barr, the, uh, the attorney general now, to find out what he's going to do. Look, the truth of the matter is even Donald Trump wants this report out there. Why not? Uh, and even if a lot of this is obviously coded or not coded, but uh, veiled in secrecy, it's going to get out there uh, because congressmen are going to leak it. You know, Pat. So eventually it's all going to get out anyhow. Sure. Well, now I understand you're going to take a little trip. You're going with the secretary of state, Mike Pompeo, to the Middle East. Do you know what he's planning to do? Right. Well, I think the common theme is going to be Iran. Uh, uh, in other words, he's going to be going to three different places, Kuwait, uh, Israel, and then Beirut. And we'll be with him. We'll be with him in Kuwait and Israel. We leave later today. Uh, and he's going to be talking about Ar the Iranian influence in the region. Obviously, the uh, April 9th elections in Israel are just around the corner. So he'll be meeting with Netanyahu. That'll be the big event coming midweek or so, actually Wednesday uh, in Israel. We'll be there for that. Uh, and we also plan to sit down with the Secretary of State in Israel, and so we're looking forward to that as well. But I think uh, what will be interesting in Kuwait will be tr basically trying, this, the, the Secretary of State trying to shore up some of that Kuwaiti uh, influence in the region to make sure that they are on board with everything from a potential Mideast peace plan that could come and, of course, that Iranian influence.
What about Bibi's uh, trials? He's tried to uh, get as close to Trump as he can. He's putting out uh, posters that shows him with the uh, president. Uh, that that relationship to Bibi is extremely important when he's running about uh, against Benny Gantz. Very important, and you're right. It's funny that you mentioned those posters. It did, it did look like Benjamin Netanyahu and Trump were running together in that April 9th election. It's all over Israel. Uh, but it's what's interesting is that not only will Mike Pompeo be in Israel visiting Netanyahu, but then Netanyahu gets on a plane and comes to the United States, and next week he'll speak at APAC, the big pro-Israel lobbying organization. He'll be here uh, to speak in front of the crowd, and so that will make headlines. And you know, it's been a very special relationship between between Netanyahu and Trump, I don't think, obviously, that's not going to change. And that gets into all of the anti-Semitism stuff that's coming up with Donald Trump. I, I, it's, it's just fascinating to, to really watch uh, Donald Trump being kind of accused of, you know, everything from the neo-Nazis and the anti-Semitism. And yet Benjamin Netanyahu and him have a wonderful relationship. He's got a Jewish uh, son-in-law. And I can just go down the list. Uh, the whole thing's pretty nutty in, in and of itself. Well, I'll say to you, David, bon voyage, have a good trip, and we look forward to your report and you get back, okay? Thanks, Pat. It's a long flight. I just want peanuts on the flight. That's all I ask. Or pretzels. I, I, think, I think they'll feed you better than that on the, on the secretary's plane. They, they've got a pretty good chef, I think, on board, I hope, for you. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in, in other news, I, I want to point out that there were rocket attacks on what was called in the press a settlement. And the settlement is a place called Ariel. And I've been to Ariel. It is a modern city. It has a university that has maybe 20, 25,000 students. It has booming industry. Uh, it is a, a complete town, thousands of people. And I read in the press that there were uh, rocket attacks on a settlement called Ariel. I mean, this is absurd, but it just shows the... Uh, uh, the, the verbiage that's out there in the press, the press don't, a lot of them don't know what they're talking about, but in that it was amazing. Well, Palestinians in Gaza celebrated after a terrorist killed two Israelis on the East Bank. John Jessup has more about that from our CBN News Bureau. That's right, Pat. A terrorist killed an Israeli soldier and a rabbi in an attack near a Jewish settlement Sunday. It happened in the city of Ariel in the territory of Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank. The attacker stabbed the soldier, took his weapon and shot him to death. He then began spraying cars with gunfire. The rabbi, a father of 12, died from his wounds. Another Israeli is in critical condition. In Gaza, Palestinians handed out sweets to celebrate what one tweet called a heroic morning. Police are on the hunt for the suspect. Well, historic flooding in the nation's Midwest has claimed at least two lives and others are still missing. Nebraska's rivers and dams just couldn't handle the overflow of water from melting snow after last week's bomb cyclone. A highway was cut in half by the floodwaters. One river swelled 17 feet in just five days. And the National Guard had to rescue people from their rooftops by helicopter. Meteorologists say more rain is in the forecast for the region on Tuesday. Pat, the Midwest is just in desperate need of a break here. Unbelievable. I, I think this is historic. I don't know the exact uh, statistics, but uh, Nebraska is almost uh, two-thirds flooded. It's just been horrible what's happening. The River Platte and some others overflowed. But the thing that I'm looking for, and we're hoping to get a story on it in a few days, the snow melt in the Sierras has been uh, in the question of 10, 15, 20 feet. It's just unprecedented how much snow. And once it begins to warm up and that snow begins to melt, there will be horrible uh, flooding coming down those mountains that will come into uh, Southern California. So the, uh, the, part, the engineers, uh, or, or U.S. Department of Engineering is is looking for something really serious. Dice may break, Sacramento could be flooded, other places uh, when the Whittier River overflows. So we're gonna to try to bring you something about that in another few days, but uh, it's really serious matters. Terry. Well, coming up, millennials struggling to navigate adulthood get a little help. You can go to your sink, and a lot of people have a plunger hanging around. Okay. Did you know that you could plunge a sink? So I did not. What they don't know, they're now learning in something called adulting school. You have to see it to believe it after this.
Well, for most people, becoming an adult starts with moving out of your parents' house and learning to manage life on your own. The millennial generation, however, seems to have a harder time jumping that rather simple hurdle. Many haven't gained the simple life skills typically expected of an adult. <laughs> it's amazing. You don't even know what a plumber's helper is. <laughs> As reporter Caitlin Burke shows us, now there are classes to teach millennials how to become adults. Hey, happy birthday! Grandma gives you $150. Congratulations! Where do you spend it, or do you? Welcome to adulting school. It's judgment-free, practical, and proving to be invaluable to a generation eager to learn. You can go to your sink, and a lot of people have a plunger hanging around. Okay, we you know that you could plunge a sink? Center. So I did not. You do Some of the classes are lighthearted. The how-tos include unclogging a sink, folding fitted sheets, patching a wall. Others focus on more essential skills. We are going to go through and talk about just a basic way to structure how you spend your money where you put it. Launching into adulthood can be tricky, and millennials, maybe more than any generation before them, have been especially vocal about feeling ill-equipped to hold the title of adult. Rebecca, at what point did you feel like an adult? Um, I haven't yet. <laughs> I think I started to feel like an adult when I got my first apartment, but I'm not even 30 yet, and I'm still of the opinion that, like, being an adult has too many negative things, so I just want to stay a kid forever. The term adulting started out as a joke, millennials using it to describe their efforts to engage in adult behavior. Then, in 2016, the growth in online use led Merriam-Webster to add adulting to its words we're watching list. Adulting. To do grown-up things, such as paying taxes, wearing pants all the time, buying your own toilet paper, you want to nap all the time, but your boss won't let you. The millennial generation comes by their bumpy transition into adulthood honestly, having never learned many of the skills that would allow them to proceed with confidence. It became clear that we wanted our kids, our parents wanted their kids to have a college education, so they started activity after activity after sport after extracurricular, and so they're not sitting down together to have a dinner. They're going, okay, grab a sandwich. We gotta get to soccer. Okay, I gotta get your sister over to lacrosse. And then you gotta go to math club. And you know, and then it's like, we're not lifting the hood of the car. There's a lot of emphasis placed in schools on getting us to graduate, getting good academic achievements, and not so much on the life skills that we need once we leave the educational system, when we're off on our own, and how can we really be independent or interdependent in the world? I don't think it is that obvious what they really need to do. There is so much information right now sp that has never been available before. It's social media, it's Instagram, it's Snapchat. There is always something coming at people right now. And so that's that sense of overwhelm that you get. So when you see that hashtag adulting, it's people struggling or it's celebrating. So um, it's not clear to them. Rachel Flanger and co-founder Rachel Weinstein started adulting school simply because of the need. It flushes out all of the noise. And it's like, here, just here, here's the information. And also here we care about you doing it. We're not just, oh, you're a millennial, you don't know, you're so spoiled. Well, nobody taught you, so here we are. Originally, Flanger and Weinstein brought in instructors and hosted pop-up workshops here in Portland. But now the demand is so great that they've gone digital. Adulting School now offers classes online so that students across the country can participate. The goal for adulting school is really to help people, is to fill in that gap that is what was missed so that people can really feel like they have a base under them to be successful. These are our future adults. These are our future politicians. These are our future. And so we want them to feel and be 
successful. A necessary gift to a generation navigating a rapidly changing world. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Portland, Maine. Uh, amazing. Isn't it amazing? You, you wonder, where were the parents? You know, I thought parents taught children how to cook and sew and sweep and clean and maybe buy groceries and stuff like that. I mean, it was sort of a given that mothers would teach their daughters and fathers would teach their sons how to drive, how to fix the car, how to shoot a gun or whatever they were supposed to do. But um, they'd certainly teach them about money, about how to count up things, they'd have allowances, and, and uh, they'd have to figure out how to spend the allowance and things. I thought that was what parents did, but apparently parents are not doing what they're supposed to do. And uh, these little uh, snowflakes are being brought up without any help, and they're not exposed to much. They just hate to be corrected. It's just terrible. You correct them, and they just begin to weep. They don't know how to handle it. So anyhow, anyhow, we need tough, resilient. But you can imagine how pliable they would be if they're in the electorate. You could raise the uh, voting age, for example, and the Democrats would just love to have millions and millions of those unformed children voting because they could be led like by some Pied Piper to come along. And they don't know history. They, they don't, are not able to make sound judgments. And therefore, they will vote in, uh, you know, incompetence and in children to run this country. And that's the danger we're facing with the current crop of Democrats. They're a bunch of children, with the exception of Biden and the old man from Vermont. Uh, those guys are, there are not many uh, mature adults in the room. And that uh, young lady from Brooklyn, she's just a child, and Beto acts like one. So you never know. But wouldn't it be nice if we were governed by mature, intelligent, godly people? Wouldn't that be great? And if, if God is going to bless a country, he will give them wise leaders. And if he's not going to bless a country, he will allow them incompetent leaders. And unfortunately, that is what's facing America unless we do something about it. Well, thank you, Caitlin. Great story. Terry? Well, and now with Nancy Pelosi suggesting that we should drop the voting age to 16, yeah. even more of what you're talking about. Can you imagine that? Yes. No, I, yeah, I really can't. It's horrible. Well, that's, you know, okay. Yeah. Right. Well, up next, first responders arrive at the scene of a horrific accident. I cried. I don't think there was a dry eye of any of the firefighters on that scene. I really right then believed that it was going to be a fatality. Watch the miraculous recovery of this driver from a blazing inferno after this. When Cody Burns was rear-ended by a truck, his SUV exploded. First responders at the scene immediately called the accident a fatality until someone spotted movement through the raging flames. May 31st, 2013. A truck traveling over 60 miles per hour rear ends an SUV at a traffic light. First responders arrived to find the SUV engulfed in flames. I really right then believed that it was going to be a fatality. The victim was 23-year-old children's pastor and performer, Cody Burns. You could see a hand hanging out of the vehicle, and, and to be honest, we'd automatically assumed it's probably going to be a body recovery. But as firefighters struggled to douse the flames. I seen his hand move, and I immediately turned and ran back to the truck and told the crews that, hey, he's still alive. It turned into a rescue instead of a recovery, so, you know, we've got to pick this up. Now they were battling the flames and the clock. It took an hour to pull Cody from the wreckage and load him on a waiting chopper. I cried. I don't think there was a dry eye of any of the firefighters on that scene. This was probably the bravest rescue I've ever witnessed in my career. Sheriff Hill went to Cody's home to inform his parents about the accident. He said, Cody's been in a bad accident and he's been life lighted. And so, my heart just sunk at that moment. Jan and her husband rushed to the hospital where Cody's two brothers and grandmother met them. They learned Cody had severe burns 
and needed to be transferred to the Richard M. Fairbanks Burn Center in Indianapolis, about two and a half hours away. They wouldn't let us see Cody right away. They put us in a little um, side room, so immediately you're thinking the worst. Once Cody was stabilized, the family was taken to see him. It was devastating to see him the first time. We prayed over him, and then they put him on the life flight, and they flew him to Indianapolis at that point. The burn center director, Dr. Rajiv Sood, assessed Cody's condition. Cody had fourth degree burns that in some places had gone to the bone. He had very significant burns, over 40% of his total body surface area. There was a uh, inhalation injury component. When patients who have burns sustain a lung injury, they have three times the chance of not making it. Jan and her family arrived at the hospital to find Cody deeply sedated. We were just kind of numb and it was just hard to take in. I just felt like I was having a nightmare and I didn't know how to pray. I didn't even know what to say. But their church and Facebook friends around the world were praying for Cody's strength and healing. Soon the doctors were confident Cody would survive, but the road ahead would be painful and uncertain. In the coming weeks, Cody would endure numerous surgeries to remove dead tissue and graft on new. The surgeries involved in burn care, are, uh, they, are, they are pretty awful. Um, and, you know, it really conceptually involves removing layers of skin first, uh, and then fat as needed, and muscle, or whatever, whatever is burnt, really. There were repeated episodes of infection. There was also the chance Cody wouldn't regain full use of his limbs. While grateful her son would live, Jan now feared for his future in ministry. He always, at an early age, had a drive and a vision to serve God, and, I, and that continued to grow as he got older. But that wasn't all he could lose. They told me they were gonna have to probably amputate three of his fingers, and I'm like, you can't, he juggles. You can't do that. Feeling like I was in a dream, I also felt a peace, knowing, and I, I know that was from others praying. Through those prayers and the skill of his doctors, Cody lost none of his fingers and began improving every day. After almost four weeks, he was breathing on his own with no permanent damage to his lungs. But as he came out of sedation, Cody struggled to face his new reality. When they would unwrap my hands, I was devastated because I could actually see my bones, parts where the flesh had been burnt off. It took a long time before I really fully understood the extent of my injuries. My heart was broke because I knew that I would probably never be able to do the things that I once loved to do. Over the next several months, Cody endured more surgeries and physical therapy. He also wrestled with depression, but says his faith saw him through. God didn't do this to me, but he allowed it to happen because he could trust me. He knew that with him being my strength, he could trust and know that Cody Burns is gonna be able to take this tragic event turn it around and make it into something beautiful. But it's only with his strength and with him guiding me and helping me. Cody is back brightening the lives of others as a performer and motivational speaker. He had a vision of, hey, I'm gonna get back to ministry and I'm gonna get back to you know, juggling and, and spreading the word with just a different uh, sort of message, which was actually more powerfully delivered at, in his case uh, after injury. He was like, off the charts on his juggling before. To see him do it now is even so much more meaningful because I know what he went through. And to see him raise his hands now and give God glory is just, it just overwhelming. I'm just so thankful. Jesus lets us know that, you know, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, he's overcome the world. And so I cling to him, he is my rock, he is my strength. He is my hope. He's the reason I exist and I continue to move forward. He will walk us through whatever he allows to be a part of our lives. And, you know, Cody is absolutely right about that. God wanted to do something greater and knew we could trust him. And so we want to encourage you in whatever you're going through right now and then pray for your needs. Pat, 
This is Carol who lives here in Virginia Beach. For two months, she had difficulty breathing and ended up needing an oxygen tank and being closely monitored. On the morning of February 25th of this year on the 700 Club, you prayed, Pat, somebody with asthma is being healed. You can hardly breathe, but God right now is opening up your airways and that condition is leaving you in the name of Jesus. Well, by faith, Carol believed she was healed. Later, her doctor confirmed that her oxygen level had risen from 60 to 95%. Tremendous. Praise the Lord. You know, I didn't know Carol, and you didn't know William from Yorktown. These are both from Virginia. Suffered an eye condition, caused his sight to be darkened. One day uh, he heard you pray, someone with an eye issue is going to be healed. William knew this was for him. He said, that's me. He is no longer has eye issues, and he gives glory to God. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there is a God in heaven. We are in this tiny little planet, and when I pray, I think how utterly insignificant I am, and you and I are. We're little tiny creatures on a little tiny planet in a little tiny solar system in a little tiny galaxy in the midst of this vast universe. And the God who created it all sent his son to, and he said he lives inside of us. He said he'll be with you, and he'll be in you. And Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when we pray, we're talking about the one who created it all. And it's nothing to heal somebody with a burn. It's nothing to recreate uh, a flesh. It's nothing to take care of asthma. It's nothing to heal somebody's eyes. Because we're talking about God Almighty. And he that comes to God, the Bible says, must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, Terry and I are going to pray together, and we're going to believe God for you. Just real simple. And if you will pray with us at this time, you say, well, but you don't understand. He can't heal me. What do you mean he can't heal you? Did he create the universe or not? Did he or isn't he? Well, of course he did. Well, where two of you gather in my name, Jesus said, I'm in the midst of them. So we're going to join hands, and we're going to pray, and we're going to pray for you. Thank Father, you, Terry and I pray now for the people in this audience. If somebody's got a serious lung condition. We just heard about fire coming into somebody's lungs. Right now, your, your lungs, it's like a breath of cold air is going all the way through your lungs right at this moment, and you are completely healed. Just Take a breath, cough, and from that moment, you're completely healed. In Jesus' name, Terry. Um, this is kind of an odd thing. This is a, a man. You have some kind of a condition with your skin where patches of where your beard comes in are just, there's no hair there. But God is growing that back for you right now. It's all being replaced, and you're going to be completely restored. In Jesus' name. Somebody, I think it's Parkinson's, but you've got a palsy of some kind. Your hand's shaking and you can't. Right now, the Lord just touched you like an angel reached down and touched your head in the name of Jesus. Touch! That shaking will stop in Jesus' name. Now, for people all over this audience, all around the world, wherever you are, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon you. May you know the glory of the Lord Jesus. And we rebuke Satan and command a spirit of infirmity to leave your body at this moment that you might know complete healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And amen. Wow. Wherever you are, call us. The Lord has done great things for you. And, uh, you know, Jesus healed a bunch of people and, and only one of them came back. He said, there were, you know, this only one came back to give thanks. Well, call and give us, let us hear what the Lord has done for you. It's 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, your questions and some honest answers. Nicole says, my boyfriend and I want to get married, but don't believe in being married through the system. Can you become married in God's eyes through a service that doesn't involve legalities? Stay tuned for Pat's answer. It's coming up.
Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Police in Australia searched two homes in New South Wales. They're aiding in the investigation into last Friday's mass shooting at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. 50 people died in the attacks. Meanwhile, stories of survival and heroism are unfolding. One case, a father shielding his son, an American citizen. The father did get shot and the son was injured, but they're both alive. Investigators say the gunman sent disturbing messages to authorities right before the attack. The mayor of Christchurch says the focus now is on healing. Well, Orphan's Promise is helping to free young women bound by addiction and abuse in Thailand. The group is doing it by partnering with a women's home to help victims rebuild what they've lost and to help them learn the necessary skills to become healthy and whole. More than 70 women and children are getting assistance, and the mothers have been offered daycare for their kids to allow them to focus on improvement. Many have given their lives to Christ while living in the home. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. Well, the first year after their mother died, two young sisters from China each lost 10 pounds from their already tiny bodies. Their sick father was unable to work enough to put food on the table. So these little girls ate wildflowers just to keep from starving. Every afternoon, Lin Yuan and her little sister picked wildflowers together. They're poor, and sometimes the flowers were all they had to eat. My dad would put some sugar in them and cook them up, but they were still bitter and disgusting. Even worse were the sweet potato leaves. Basically, we were eating pig food, and sometimes we even had to beg people for it. After the girl's mother died, their father got sick and dizzy a lot. The doctor said the only way he'd get better is if he rested more. But that meant little money and no real food for his daughters. They each lost over 10 pounds. Their faces got yellow, and their immunity was really bad. I was starving my girls. I was useless as a dad. Many nights, the girls went to bed hungry. I felt empty. A lot of times, I felt so bad that I couldn't go to school. So even though hard labor made his health worse, Mr. Ma went to work in the fields. One time he fainted. I remembered my youngest daughter said, Dad, I may be small, but I will help you. When I heard that, I just cried. The only thing I could think that would help is if I got a boot to pull up the fields so I wouldn't get so dizzy. I tried to borrow money, but no one would help. So he prayed. My uncle had told me about Jesus, so I prayed, Jesus, if you can hear me, help me. Shortly after this, Mr. Ma's uncle put him in contact with CBN. We gave him the bull he needed to help plow his fields so he wouldn't get dizzy and sick anymore. We also gave him some cows to start a small business and provided staple food for the family until his new business took off. My girls finally have healthy food, and they are gaining weight. We don't have to eat wild flowers. Now we can pick them just for fun, because we have plenty to eat, and I can go to school and concentrate. God brought CB in to help us. His love is so great. Now I go to church every Sunday to worship Him. Without you, my children would still be starving. Thank you, CBN. You changed our lives. You changed their lives completely, not just in shoring up the grief and the pain and the hunger they were experiencing in the moment, but also opening up a whole new future to them. Thank you, 700 Club members. That's the kind of thing you are doing all around the world, and it's happening every day. 
We want to say to the rest of you, if you haven't joined the 700 Club yet, what a great day this is to make your commitment. You're joining with thousands of us who are out to change the world with the love of Christ. This is what that commitment looks like. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. That makes you a 700 Club member. And we just want to say thank you for considering joining with us. The way to do that is to go to your phone right now. You can call our toll-free number. It's so simple. It's 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to cbn.com. And listen, when you join today, we've got a special thank you for you. It's Pat's latest teaching called The I Wills of God. This is from Psalm 91. You're going to love this. In fact, this is Gus. He lives in Tobihana, Pennsylvania. He said, thank you for the I Wills of God DVD. I needed a refresher course on love, faith, and a fresh touch from God. Pat, I want to thank you for always being there for us. You were there when you led me and my wife to the Lord, and you are here now. Thanks and God bless. So Gus enjoyed his DVD. We're going to send yours out to you as soon as you give us a call or log on and join the 700 Club. The I Wills of God. It's our way of saying thank you for caring about other people. We're going to be right back with your questions and some honest answers. So don't go away. We've got some beauties today. Well, it's time to answer some of the email questions that you all have sent in. And Pat, this first one comes from Nicole, who says, I believe marriage originally is to ask God's permission to be together to have sex to make children. The system or government makes it seem to be all about legal reasons and money. Although we have children and both have never been married, marriage is to be under God. Can you become married in God's eyes through a service that doesn't involve legalities? Uh, well, of course you can. When you commit to one another that you indeed are going to uh, live a life together, it's, it's nice to have it solemnified in a church, uh, and you make vows together before a congregation, and the congregation pledges that they will support you and your uh, proposed spouse. The fact that you do it uh, with a legal uh, binding thing, uh, it's a protection, frankly. Uh, you know, it, it, there are certain obligations that a man takes on and a woman takes on in marriage, and the law will support that. But the law doesn't make marriage before God. The, what makes it before God is your commitment to your spouse and the spouse's commitment to you. And uh, if two of you were living on a desert island and there wasn't any uh, government around, you could still get married and you could get married before God. But you've got to mean it. I mean, you, you, you know, uh, until death do us part is what you say, and you can do the vows or whatever. But uh, society wants to build up that marriage. It's not that they've got a bunch of rules they're trying to uh, make around you, but they want to help you. Theoretically, <laughs> that's what it was supposed to be. All right, what else? Okay, this is Christine who says, I am a Christian woman who was out for a dinner with a female Christian friend. Not far from our table, there were two men sitting there kissing a lot. I felt sick and had to confront the men, telling them that this is a sin. The restaurant staff told me I needed to leave. I was trying to help these sinners and got treated like this. Did I do something wrong? Uh, you sure did. I mean, let's face it, you know, we're talking about beating oil. I mean, oil is what uh, lubricates the gears, and what you're doing is just reaching out and and condemning somebody, say, what you're doing is wrong. It's not your business. It really isn't. It's before God. You want to pray for those men that are doing this, or you pray for them. Um, if you want to, don't like it, you want to get up and leave, by all means leave. But well, we can't go around all over the world telling people they're sinners and telling them they're doing terrible things. Uh, but when you're invited into a situation and somebody says, would you help me? Well, by all means, help them. Uh, you know, but I don't think we should impose ourselves on people that the way you did. I mean, you weren't invited to that table. Uh, if they said, come over and, and talk to us, and that'd be a different matter, but they didn't. Okay. Okay, this is Dan who says, hello, Pat. Bernie Madoff is in prison for stealing and spending his clients' retirement funds and leaving them with nothing. Isn't what the government's doing almost the same thing? They took our Social Security and Medicare money and spent it on their own debts, et cetera. Well, you put it exactly correctly, but I don't think any congressman would want to go to jail for doing it. But uh, it really was thievery. They, they, the money was given. You, you paid your money in under a particular designated fund, 
and it was taken by Congress and spent for the general fund. And uh, it's a misappropriation of funds. If a lawyer uh, co-mingled the assets of his clients, he'd go to jail for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't lock congressmen up for misappropriating money. They sh probably should be. Uh, <laughs> That'd be one way to clean the swamp, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> put them all in jail, lock them up. <laughs> okay. What's okay. Next? This is Betty who says, I've heard people say, oh my God, when referring to a certain situation. This really bothers my soul. I was wondering what you have to say about this, Pat. Is it showing disrespect for the holiness of God? Well, uh, of course it is. Now, remember the command, thou shalt not take the name of Yahweh, Yehovah, your God, in vain. And so it's the name of Jehovah that is in the commandment, not the name of God himself. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's Elohim, and they've got other forms of God. But I just think it's wrong to say, oh, my God, you, you're, you're, you're swearing by God, and you're calling in the name of deity on what you're doing. And I, I think it's wrong. I think people who use the name of Jesus, who use the name of God carelessly, uh, it's a form of blasphemy, and I think it's wrong. All right. Okay, this is Susan who says, Dear Pat, my husband's sister got married to a woman when Virginia made it legal for gays to marry. We did not attend the wedding and have been asked why by family and friends ever since. As Christians, we decided not to attend since we do not believe in same-sex marriage. How do we explain to these family and friends that want to know why? We love them both and have no regrets. Well, they're putting you in an impossible situation. I, just like that cake baker, he didn't want to bake a cake for a gay wedding. So the state came after him, and he, he had to go all the way to the Supreme Court to get justice. But nevertheless... I don't think you have to condone same-sex marriage if you disagree with it. I don't think you have to attend the ceremonies. I don't think you have to smile and act like it's okay. So you, you, you're you taking a stand that what you think they're doing is wrong. And therefore, uh, uh, if somebody asks you, just say, look, it offends my religious beliefs. You don't have to say anything more than that or just keep your mouth shut. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you are not required by God's law to participate in supporting something, an activity you feel is sinful. Just that simple. All right. Okay. This is Dave who says, my wife was working with our pastor at the church. About two years ago, they got real busy with church work and premarital, marital counseling sessions. They started hanging out more and drinking to the point of getting drunk. I recognized the situation and asked that she not be with him. She refused, and I asked her to leave. I bought her land, a trailer, and furnished her home, $210,000. She still wants more. I have much anger toward them both. What should I do now? I, I, I don't know the situation. I'd hate to get involved in that. But uh, uh, I think what your, your spouse is doing, uh, yeah, well, he doesn't really say whether they're legally divorced yet or not. So that's kind of awkward. But I mean, why would he, in either sense, but he needs the, legal The, the aid, pastor right? himself should yeah. be called into account. The church himself should deal with that pastor. He's doing something wrong, and he knows it in his heart. But it's so easy to say, well, I'm counseling that dear sister. Yeah. And the next day, you know, well, the dear sister and I are working together, and we're trying to help these other people. And you know, a bond is being established. The next thing you know, the spiritual adultery. So mm -hmm. uh, you, you could bring that one before the church and say, look, gentlemen and ladies, I, I want to bring this uh, charge against your elder. I think he's done a wrong thing. But, I, you know, you say, how do you handle all that? It is, there's a lot of complexity in people's lives, and I, I don't have all the answers, but the answers are pretty clear in the Bible that what they're done is wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for all those questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time for more of them, but uh, you're really asking some very important things. and I'll do my best to provide honest answers to your very good questions. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of James. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Well, we've got uh, former Navy SEALs who are rec rescuing child sex slaves. 
So for Terry and me, this is all the time we've got. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.